This is True North Story, the original podcast series. Learn, love, listen, live. Are you ready to discover your True North Story? With your hosts, Tama Fulton and John Hudson Massaro. Into a place so dark, it breaks your heart. The devil's teeth stay sharp and they leave their mark. And everything you build fucking falls apart. If you made it this far, you're right there where you start. And people work hard and just get by. Can't hang your head or hold it too high. No matter what's at stake, you stake your claim. And I won't live my life in vain. So tell us a little bit, Lance, about your background is amazing. So you're born and raised in Alaska. Your family has been very intimately involved in dog sled right from the beginning. Your dad, tell us a little bit about growing up your childhood in Alaska and, and being around a family of dog sled folks. Obviously, growing up around it, I didn't know the meaning of it, I guess, and how, uh, how much of a lifestyle it was or, uh, you know, and what a big deal it was, of course. It was... Um, it was just a way of life, you know, and dogs were always around, and, you know, we, was, we always had people in and out of the house, and we was always at other people's houses, and there was, <laughs> there was always more dogs in the house than there was people. Or, again, for me, you know, not knowing the significance of it, you know, it was all just a bunch of jibber-jabber, so to speak. You know, it was always pretty exciting to get to the weekends and be able to go down to the local sprint tracks and, and hook up however many dogs from one to five, you know, and in the weekend, uh, you know, Saturday maybe or Saturday and Sunday, depending on the race and, and different locations. And it was always fun to, you know, basically just get on the back of a sled and haul ass around in a circle with a bunch of other kids. And we didn't have no real responsibility. They, you know, parents took care of the dogs and we ran off to whatever corner of the, you know, woods we could with our friends. And, you know, that that was more what I remember about it as an early age. It wasn't about um, the breeding part of it. The the, uh, the racing part, it wasn't all that important. It was all just fun and games, you know. So, unfortunately, my parents, um, you know, were, were so involved in it. My dad was a co-founder of the Iditarod, you know. And, again, I didn't know what the hell that meant or what it entitled. And your dad was a winner of the Iditarod, correct, in 1978? Yeah. So yeah, he, he right. went on to win the race, which was, um, <laughs> you know, for again, for myself and my little brother who, Stand at the finish line when that took place. You know, we didn't know exactly what that meant or how big of a life changing right. moment it was for him or any of those things, you know. But one thing for sure, when I, I remember it plain as day, and again, not knowing what that meant or how embedded in my memory bank it became, you know, somewhere along the line, I felt that that was something I needed to do as well. And of course, the older I got, the more. I understood, and, and the more, uh, I'm, you know, that I understood that one finish from my dad and how significant that was, and, and the people that we were around on a daily basis, and, and what they brought to the sport, you know, Joe Rainton Sr., and George Atla, and Gareth Wright, and Doc Lombard, and a lot of these guys that are just names now to a lot of people, you know, those were people that I wanted to be just like when I was growing up, and, and still, today, for our for our sport, it has a lot, of, a lot of significance, a lot of history, and you know, a lot of memories, and we could probably all say the same. We wish a lot of things uh, <laughs> we understood more at the time, you know. I just didn't know these people, and I didn't know what they what they brought to the sport and how um, legendary they are today, and it's... Um you know, kind of took it with a grain of salt, so to speak, back then. The Iditarod for Alaskans and for a lot of folks in America that follow that sport, it's a big deal, Lance. What, how did your dad decide that he wanted to get sponsors and make this big event happen every year? Well, he was just he was real good buddies with Joe Sr., who was, you know, the guy that thought of the whole Iditarod concept and get it going again. And, and my dad, you know, just his buddy, you know, and... And knowing a lot of people throughout the state because of his, uh, he was an iron worker and he flew around the state and built a lot of the schools and airplane hangars and whatnot that these, these villagers are using today, you know. So uh, he had connections, I guess. Why he wanted to do it, I mean, it was uh, dabbled with the dogs and the sprint racing and it was um, one of the things that people use them for trapping and hunting and things like that. But there, the sprint racing was becoming a, quite a big thing and now all of a sudden here's this ultra challenge, you know ultimate challenge across the state of Alaska by dog team. I mean, who in their right mind would do this? <laughs> <laughs> the, it was more of a personal challenge and, a, and whatnot, probably the first time they went. But, of course, once you make it, you know, you, you, you remember all the things that you could have improved on or pretty soon it become, you know, what it is today. And we're, 
we're, we're scooting across the state of Alaska in eight and a half days. I mean, it came a long ways, and it's still it's still the ultimate challenge with the dog and, and the human. And it's just a race uh, against competitors. It's a personal challenge and a personal goal, so to speak. And there's no other sport like it. Anybody in this world can be a part of it, and that's very unique in itself. So, so true. Um, so, when Lance, when did it change for you personally from – just being a part of your youth and, and the background growing up to something that, that really um, you wanted to pursue, that you were passionate about, that, that you were like, I want to take this to the next level and I want to, you know, have my own team of dogs and be responsible for that and, and you know, move forward and try and, and win this. When, when did that start to kind of manifest itself for you that, that this is in your future? Well, um that's a great question. They, um, from about 17 to 29, I didn't own a dog or want to be around them, basically. I uh, I spent most of the time uh, on the Bering Sea as a, as a commercial fisherman. And, oh, uh, okay. And, and the, you know, the, the majority of the time that I was out there, all I could think about and and, and actually wanted to do was to run the idea rod someday. And... Because it was part of my upbringing, and then I became so disconnected with it, so far away from it. But I still got the satisfaction of watching my my oldest brother um, succeed, Rick, who ultimately won the Idid Rod himself. And, uh, you know, again, other races, and he was very successful. And, you know, people that I'd work with were, hey, when are you going to ever do that race? You know, and I'd just make up some kind of excuse or reason why I couldn't. And then, uh, and then um, something happened, I guess. And I, you know, I had done a lot of things that my parents weren't proud of in those years of fishing, and they weren't bragging about. And I lost a lot of uh, relationship with both my parents, who had, you know, they'd split up prior uh, years prior, and uh, it just wasn't a comfortable feeling for me. And I decided that I wanted to kind of, you know, show my parents both. And, Mostly, uh, I say my dad because mom was always in my in my life and kind of supportive, and even though I wasn't doing things that she would uh, be proud of. But dad, okay. he kind of just, uh, me kind of forgot about the son, you know, that I wish he had, and and I just wanted to kind of rebuild that relationship. And I knew that trying to talk to him, or I'd never be able to come up with the words. So I decided I'm going to run the idea rod one day and just show him that I could commit to something. And follow through with it, you know, and hopefully he'd be proud of that. I'll never forget, um, that was in 2001, I decided I was going to go, and I and I did. I borrowed a bunch of dogs, and I found some on the streets, I got some out of the pound, and I was going to go to Nome just one time. I'll never forget getting to Nome that year. And it, it took everything I had to, to get to the finish line, because I hadn't been feeling all that good, and didn't really think too much about that part of it, because now I was determined just to, to get to Nome, and... Um, when I did, I saw here's both my parents standing there, you know, who hadn't really seen each other in many years, and they were both just standing there holding each other, and they were excited, they were smiling, they were laughing, they were they were happy and proud and crying and all those things that uh, you know I hadn't really saw in any of my upbringing. You know, here's something that I'll never forget that the face that they you know had, they were just so happy uh, for what I just achieved, and and I think that. Um, that's probably the one main reason I'm still doing it today. They are proud. They are happy. And, and they're ecstatic about the things we've achieved. And that was in 2001 when I decided that I'm going to turn my life around and, and do something that not only that my parents would be proud of, but that I, should, I could be proud of. And I never really dreamt at that particular moment of what my career might become. But as a boy, I definitely just uh, had dreams of winning the Edgar Rod and, and being like my dad and my brother and, and um, the thoughts and dreams about became an end because at the end of that first I did rod, I, uh, like I said, I hadn't been feeling too good. And I got diagnosed with uh, stage four throat cancer immediately after the race. And um, I didn't even get to absorb what I had just accomplished in 2001 how, race. How and, close was that, Lance, from when that moment where you saw your parents and you finished the race and all of that until the diagnosis? What was the length of time there? You didn't get to celebrate very much. No, it was just a few days. It was just wow. a few days. It was pretty serious, you know, and I, like I said, I didn't even get to absorb what I had just accomplished. And, and now all of a sudden, here's my family back around me, 
for different reasons, and it wasn't because of this race and the things that I had done and, and tried to win back their respect and their renown. All of a sudden, I'm, I've got them with me because I'm fighting for my life. It was just an odd feeling for me. It wasn't why how I intended on getting the attention of my parents. So when I was diagnosed, the doctors flat out told me that I probably wouldn't live through that whole ordeal, and, and that if I did, that I'd um, I'd certainly never race dogs again. And, and that comment that the doctor made right then and there made me decide that this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, not to prove them wrong, but here's a guy I just met telling me how I was going to live my life if I was <laughs> able to survive. And I thought that, you know, man, my parents told me I could do anything I wanted if I set my mind to it. And I'll never forget the, just that feeling that I got mad at this guy. And I was now more than more than ever adamant about doing the things that I wanted to do to show my parents what I set out to do. So that was when I decided, like, I'm going to take this serious. I'm going to focus all my adolescent behavior and, and rebel teenage whatever. I'm going to focus on this race. And, uh, man, I did exactly that. And, you know, I, I did live through that whole ordeal. And I did um, start the idea rod the following year. And it was against the doctor's orders. It was uh, pure determination that I did. I started with a feeding tube in my stomach and uh you know i didn't make it to the finish line that year but i still today say it was the toughest race i ever ran and you know the fact is and the bottom line is my parents both are proud of the things i've done they brag about the things i've accomplished and uh our relationship today is as strong as as it's ever been because i never really had a strong relationship in the first place i'm proud of that you know being out of there on the Bering Sea, I know for folks who watch Deadliest Catch or who know about Dutch Harbor and, you know, all the places out there with fishermen, that takes a lot of courage and strength and fortitude to do that. So you are definitely a guy who can take on a challenge. At what point did you decide, I really want to turn my life around. I want to do stuff that's going to make my mom and dad proud of me. What were you thinking at that time? What made that change happened for you well i um <laughs> this might not be the ideal um thing to say on a family show but um <laughs> you know I, w I woke up basically on the uh cement pad uh gasping for air i had uh had more chemicals in my body than anybody probably ever should i uh, spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on um partying and uh i found myself like i said gasping for air thinking i was dying I just said that was enough. I, something's got to change here. Nobody knew where I was at. Nobody would have cared if I would have quit breathing. That's a hard thing to accept about yourself, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's where it was. And, and I just, I realized right then and there is either, you know, I lived for a reason and I don't know exactly why. Then I get faced with a, you know, even a harder medical condition that I lived through. Of, of all the things that I've done, I feel that uh, there's been many times that I shouldn't be here and I am. And, why? And there must be a message. There must be a reason. Or a... And yeah, I, I had a rough upbringing in a lot of ways. And I'm not ashamed of that at all, but certain things that just kind of keep you grounded, you know, and that's, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. <laughs> so for me, it was one of those moments that um, something had to change. And it was, uh, I could only imagine my parents having to identify my body or find me in a situation that I was in and how disappointing and embarrassing and I wanted to do it. I wanted change. I wanted myself. No more than anything, I wanted to change. You know? That's awesome. One of the recurring themes that we see with so many of the people we talk to about their true north story is that there's a catalyst, that something has happened that makes them want to change or want to move in a different direction, you know, whether it's hitting rock bottom or whether it's addiction or it's something else or, you know, or maybe financial or, or it can be a lot of things. And then once it's almost like this light bulb goes on, then it's like they want a purpose and passion and they take off and they're like, okay, wait a minute, I want to do this and I want to accomplish this and I want to make my parents proud. And it sounds like your story is no different. It's the total comeback story. Let's forward the ball a little bit here and talk. So you went through the diagnosis with the throat cancer. You underwent extensive surgery and radiation. You come out the other side and now you're on fire. You want to live with purpose. Tell us where you go from there. I don't mean to mean it was that easy. I, I know it was not. Believe me, I, I'm just saying that because we know what happened happens in 2007 and forward you have an incredible run I did, of wins. I, did. I, man, I can't say it was because of one specific thing or 
you know, that I had a better dog team. But what I did have was um, a real reason and not my own personal goal, so to speak. It was, um, like I said, you know, this whole thing with, with my folks. I all of a sudden had felt that I had a second chance at life yet again. And mm -hmm. now here's, um, here's something that I felt that I could do somewhat naturally. A lot of people try extremely hard and put in a lot of time and effort and trying to build a team and compete. And I, I think a lot of my um, work ethic and whatnot coming from fishing was carried over to training the same concept as far as uh, they only know what we teach them basically and the, the way i work throughout the day and i'd spend months out, out there on the water sometimes and at the end of months i was still the, the guy that was going just the same speed and whatnot as it was when i started and all these other guys have been home and came back and i'm still there and um i just i guess i've never really tried to copy anybody or think the same way as people and and i just i got a lot of time to from the outside looking in and watching the people who are succeeding and winning and thinking, man, if, that, if I did this and I did that and I see some of their weaknesses and I see their strengths and I could build on my weaknesses and capitalize on my strengths. And I just started putting a dog basically together that <laughs> was built around me and my beliefs and my thoughts and my visions and my personalities. And, and I wasn't trying to, to copy the guy that won. I wanted to do something different. And, um, again, I really don't know if I did any of those things right. I don't know if I did them. Uh, I don't know if they, they happened unbeknownst to me without trying or if they were just a complete coincidence. Or... Well, Tama and I always hold each other accountable. We do not believe in coincidences. We think things happen for a reason and for a purpose. And maybe we don't know what they are at the time. But when yep. you look back and you see the success of three consecutive wins, and then you came back and won another, a fourth a year or two later, right? So No, no. I, no I, I oh, did, did you win all four in a row? row? Yeah. On the quest and on the other row. Oh, that's, so, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. I believe things do happen for a reason, and I also believe that you have to sacrifice something to gain something else. And I think that I've had to sacrifice over the years my body, uh, right? Basically, being the main one, and in, in order to succeed, you know, this sport. And you know, after 30 years, um, I finally realized, yeah, I guess everybody's put on this earth for a purpose, for a reason. And and my reason was definitely uh, to race, train, and promote sled dogs. It's something I feel I'm naturally good at. I don't try as hard as a lot of people do. I don't put in half the hours probably a lot of people do. But I also say that it's quality, not quantity. My dogs come first. And I know that they've saved my life many times in many ways. And again, took all, you know, that adolescent behavior and I, I, I focused on dogs and I and I let them be dogs and I don't ask them to do anything that's not to their, their ability, not beyond. I don't, I don't put my goals above their ability. And I'll never win a race at the expense of my team. Dogs basically have provided everything that I own to this day, and I'm still uh, the guy that could easily go astray if I didn't have the dogs to focus on. Yeah, who knows what I'd be doing. This is True North Story, the original podcast series. Learn, love, listen, live. And now, back to the program. So stand up, shout it out. Put them in the air if you like it loud. We only got one shot, so let's make it count. It's a takedown, nobody can stop us now. Stand up, shout it out. Say it loud so the world can't drown us out. And before we depart, let's leave a mark. Cause light shines brighter in the dark. When we scream, our lips don't make a sound. We march with feet on solid ground. We walk when no one wants to go on this sun travel road. Tell me a little bit about your team, Lance. Do, do you have like a mom and grandma and auntie and dad and uh, have you kept the same parts of the That's same team that. yeah yes ma'am um uh, my whole team and my whole kennel right now comes from a dog named zorro that was my main stud dog for many many years and he was uh 15 years old uh when he passed he had sired over 600 dogs 200 puppies wow not all of them from me i had because of uh the Yes, there, and everybody in the sport wanted a piece of him, and uh, and we bred him to just about every kennel in the in the state at one time or another. And uh, a lot of those now, of course, I bred you know a lot of them for myself. And now that that whole line is what I have today. It's um, at the moment I have 25 raceable dogs, three years old. I started my kennel, um, my team over in 2013 when uh, when I ended up I got to the finish line of that year and had yet 
some more medical things I had to take care of, and I wasn't able to uh, wasn't able to race the following year. So I sold my main team to a friend of mine who uh, went that year and took him to fifth place, which was nice to see. But wow. uh, the, the whole team that I'm running right now, 25 of them, they're all three years old. Grandchildren of Zorold, because his son, Dred, was the father of all. Now, I had nine females bred to the same male within two weeks of each other. <laughs> You yeah, had lots of puppies. I did. I had 65 puppies. Oh, my and, goodness. Whoa. And that, oh. that is the rebuild of this whole kennel yet again. So they just turned three years old during the Adirad. Well, end of February and beginning of March. And unfortunately, I was not uh, able to take them to the finish line this year because of yep, my own health issues. They're all either grandchildren or great-grandchildren. So all, the, all nine females were either sisters or half-sisters bred to the same male. You can imagine, they, you know, they all look basically the same. They're all, with the exception of just a couple, they're all black. I've nicknamed them the, the ninjas. <laughs> they're, uh, <laughs> you know, they're, they're big, they're powerful, awesome. they're fast, they're, they're opinionated. You know, they're a very, oh, man, beautiful team. You know, and I, I said, I don't really care who, who was driving them or who owned them. I'd say the same thing about them. They are the team to be. And I hope I can uh, get myself back in order yet one more time and be the guy on the back that, you know, I need to be in order to uh, show the world what they're made of. Because um, I've had a few bad years here lately, and I feel that I need one more. I need one good one for me, and then I can maybe bow out gracefully here because the older I get, the harder it is becoming, no doubt about it. Right. So this team you have, you're real proud of. What, for Lance, yeah. makes a great sled dog? Oh, just their willingness to please and their their enthusiasm to do what they do. They're, there's a lot of dogs out there that are probably not really uh, enthused about going a thousand miles. They do it because <laughs> they love to run and they want to be a part of the team. But this group that I have is exceptional in that department. They they want to run. They want to. They're proud, you know. And and you can see just in their in their vigorness and their opinions and the way they are always mouthing off. <laughs> they they are the they are the Michael Jordans of our sport. They know they're badass and they want to show everybody. You know, and it, it is not just me that says that. Everybody that sees this team says, "Damn, you know, we're all looking for ones like that." And 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 it is the the combination of things that I've put together over the years and the things that I've seen. I would want to see as a spectator. You know, I want to see them eating. I want to see them happy. I want to see them fat and rolling around and, and barking and screaming, you know, in the worst conditions. To them, they take it with a grain of salt, and it's no big deal. It's the everyday way of life, and they love this shit. I hope I can be the man they expect me to be. Your attitude definitely is, Lance. How much do they eat in a meal? How much do you feed them? Well, the, the, I mean, on, a, on an average work day, if they're racing, they can consume up to 15,000 calories in a day. Now, you're not going to put 15,000 calories in one meal. So uh, we break that down in small portions. We feed them every couple hours, take that calorie content. And uh, so there again, team that I have now, if you throw your boot down there, you better, you know, you better not want it back because they'll eat it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they inhale this stuff. And, you know, there's two things that I feel are the most important is their appetite and their attitude. The food is their fuel. And without the willingness and the want to go, then what's the point? If you got a full tank of gas and it don't run, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, so, again, those two things I felt are key. I built my team based around those two things. And uh, you put 15,000 calories on the ground and they consume it all. You can go as far as you want uh, at, at, in any condition. And the rest is up to me to be able to kind of guide them and control that um, gas throttle. Yeah. When you're doing the Iditarod, is it you, solely you, you stop for the night? Is it you or do you have a crew that comes and kind of helps you? Yeah, no, it, it's all us. We, um, there are people in the checkpoints that, you know, that run the checkpoints. And there's veterinarian staff and uh, checkpoint personnel. But we are on our own as far as taking care of our dogs. Uh, nobody can help feed them. Nobody can bed them down. You can you can have assistance just getting into the checkpoint and getting to your parking spot. And then uh, somebody stands in front of your team as you get ready to go and maybe points in the direction to out of town. You're on your own. Uh, you, you, uh, if you get caught without uh, having outside assistance, then it's automatic disqualification. So do you pack your bedroll and your food and everything with you? Are you taking all that with you? Well, we have a certain amount of stuff that we have to have. Yeah, uh, mandatory gear is, is basically survival gear for yourself and your dog. So uh, axe, a sleeping bag, snowshoes. You have to have um, booties. 
for your dog's feet, two pounds of dog food per dog. Now, that's all on your sled. Uh, and there is, you know, the cook pot to make uh, water, you know, some personal gear, a veterinarian handbook, things that we have to have. But you're not going to carry everything that you need for a 1,000 miles on your sled. At the checkpoints, there are um, 23, 24 checkpoints that we can advance. We'll have sent dog foods and uh, replacement garments for ourselves and maybe an extra sled. All these things that you might need. Um, you're not going to feed the same food 40 above as you would 40 below. So you got to have different foods for the dogs. You have to have different foods for yourself. Lots of liquids. A lot of people don't realize that um, when you hallucinate, it's because you get dehydrated. If you keep hydrated, keep eating, keep your energy level up, stay up longer. Just like the dogs, if you feed them every couple hours, you can go forever. Forget about themselves. You can't be out there eating, uh, you know, Snickers bars and, and Coca-Cola. Uh, you're probably not going to have much fun. But if you eat the right things and stay hydrated and you train and, you know, race the way you train, train the way you race. I say it to everybody. Then uh, you'll have a fun trip and it's not that difficult. People are always in awe that we can stay up for days at a time and uh, and still think rationally and know how to take care of ourselves in 40 below. So, um, it is what you make it, no doubt about it, and you got to train for it. But nutrition is key. Nutrition is key. That is incredible. I I wanted to ask you just real quick, Lance. It seems to me like you're kind of their theme that I'm seeing emerge here is that you're a survivor, one, and that you're in the comebacks and rebirth, you know, whether it be from setbacks or from just different things that have happened in your life and you want to come back and even alluding to winning the Adidarad one more time. What influences would you say, what single thing is driving you right now? Like if you had to name one thing, is it being a father? Is it being a husband? Is it pleasing your parents? What is it that's most dear to you? And, you know, I mean, if I had to, I mean, it might sound ridiculous, but I've been fortunate enough to uh, live the way I've wanted and do the things I've wanted to do without really having to answer to too many people or, you know, take two weeks off from work to go do it. Eh. How do I put this politely? I don't want to get a job that I suck at for an asshole that I can't work for. <laughs> I That's understandable. Love working for myself and making my own hours and doing the things I want to do when I want to do them, and not I might not be the best at what I do, but I have fun doing it. I get to go and travel around the state or beyond when I want to do it. I don't have to ask anybody to do it. If you want something bad enough, you make it happen. That's how I am. I don't fit well inside of a building for any length of time doing the same things over and over again. I like being on the road with my dogs and my girl and, and my baby boy now. And, you know, like now, you know, we're traveling the state racing cars. There is nothing at the, in the world at the moment that I'd rather be doing. Cruising down the road with my family and my car heading to a, another spot. You know, I get to see some old friends, make some new friends. I'm not doing the same thing twice, and it's never boring. That's I just awesome. don't want to have to go punch a time clock or... <laughs> You know, rely on somebody else's business to, to succeed, you know, so I can get a paycheck Friday to check actually don't bounce or, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I should have added in that list, Lance, an adrenaline junkie, too. I think, what type of race? Well, that's, yeah, there's a, there's a legends class. Definitely have an addiction to uh, adrenaline and, and <laughs> competition and, oh, I don't know, I maybe it is. Maybe it is just a, a little bit of living on the edge and, like I said, I just, I have this do what I want kind of attitude and, and a lot of people that doubt me or look at me and judge me or I thrive on that kind of stuff and, and to be underestimated is even you know even better to add the log to an already burning fire basically I was the guy that jumped on a crab boat and you know weighed 100 pounds less than everybody and they laughed at me by the end of the fishing trip you know they were all exhausted and I was saying what's wrong get your ass up let's go fishing there are more pots <laughs> out there <laughs> oh yeah no, and, and, I, and I was hooked from the day I started I've told my girl many times, I love that lifestyle and I love fishing. I was good at it, but it wasn't a healthy environment. Again, you know, you got to sacrifice something to gain something else. Well, I was uh, definitely abusing myself, but I was, I, was, um, I was a good fisherman. And I'm not saying that just because I wanted to be. I, I was, and I was. Captains would call me on a regular basis and try to get me to their boats. And made, um, I made good decisions when I was tired and uh, I didn't get overly excited about much and worked well under pressure. You know, and I feel that that's kind of the same things that happen on the back of a dog sled or in the, in the front of a race car. So I'm living the life that I feel I was led to lead. Yeah, it just took me a while to figure it out. You know, Lance, I'd say you live a life of adventure. 
<laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> I think my girl could uh, could uh, attest to that. It's never a dull moment with me. Always something exciting happened. It's always a uh, maybe a situation that you don't want to be in, but when you get done with them and you deal with them, it's like, hey, you know, just another day. Another day, well, another would, adventure. Well, I would add, too, that Lance definitely knows his true north because he is, is not allowing himself to be put in any box, to be categorized in any way. You are living your own life. And, boy, I'll tell you what, there's a lot of inspiration for a lot of people in that who wish they could do the same thing. Well, then I think, um, you know, we've ran across a lot of those people that we uh, have inspired or, you know, motivated to get off the couch. And if I'm an inspiration to people, then great, because I don't have to do anything other than be me and do the things I love to do. And how easy is that? I like that. So, Lance, if folks are out your way and they want to go on a dog sled ride, they want to see your dogs in the kennel, how do they find you? Well, the real simple, if you if you got uh, access to a computer, just LanceMackey.com. That'll pull up maybe more information on me than anybody cares to know about. But uh, <laughs> you can... Uh, you can certainly get a hold of me directly um, through my website, email. Go to my website. You can uh, book a ride, a tour through that, and you can call me directly on my phone, which is always pretty simple. Well, not really big into texting, but if uh, you call me, I'll answer the phone most of the time. Ah, oh, that's great, Lance. Wednesday, I did a ride. Always the first weekend in March. And uh, at the moment, we're on the on the list of entrance, and we'll see how uh, the next several months uh, go. But I, uh, if I make it to the starting line this year, I would certainly... Um, not want to miss this one if I was a spectator. We will be tuned in and we will be hoping with all of our might that we're going to see you and your beautiful team at the start and at the finish. Yeah, that's, that's that's more important than start in my opinion. But, you know, and, and throughout the year, there's a lot of race people updated on our website going on. We're actually going to, uh, we're going to be in Norway, 7th and 8th of January. We'll be running the race over there. So again, here we get to go do the things we love to do in a different country. And I didn't have to take off work to, to get permission to go do it. <laughs> You are blessed, Lance. You are. I I mean, we we do have fun, and that's what life's all about, you know? I had the serious part of my life already slapped me in the face several times, so let's have some fun now, you know? That's right. Well, we wish you all the best. Congratulations on your new little guy. Uh, Thank you. So happy for for you guys and also for the race that's coming up here in just a few months. Yeah, right around the corner. So we're getting revved up here. We'll be ready to go. Thank you so much, Lance. Tim oh, and I both, and Jenny interest. too. We appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. I thank you, for, you know, for the uh, interest in what we're doing, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll give give them a run for their money and get some people excited to want to be, uh, you know, the next Eddie Draw champions. Maybe. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you for listening to True North Story, the series. Follow us on Twitter at True North Story. And tune in next time for another True North Story.